papers here. I'm excited. Let's get straight to these health headlines. Um, we're going to go straight to the Daily Mail, first of all. And this one, I like this one. Good, isn't it? Walking helps prevent memory loss. So just three... 15 minutes walks every single week helps with your memory. So first thing to say is maybe not today. <laughs> if we could just maybe walk inside not today, because yeah. you know we want to stay safe. But essentially we're talking about the benefits of exercise. And experts at the University of Pittsburgh have looked at 3,000 adults. So you know this is quite a sizable study, and they have showed that moderate exercise helps improve memory. Now the question we're going to ask is why and how. And exercise does wonderful things. It keeps your blood pressure low. Good blood pressure, we're going to have a nice supply of, of blood to the head. Yeah. It is anti-inflammatory. It helps you produce more muscle mass, which has loads of benefits. Helps you not get cancer, helps you, you know, not have a heart attack or stroke. And these are all things which will impact on your brain and on your memory. And what's really nice is that we don't all have to be doing marathons. You know, right. We moderate can exercise. be doing moderate exercise and you don't even necessarily have to say, well, I'm going to go to the gym now. I'm going to go training that actually if you walk your kids to school and back yeah. that's probably half an hour you know and and that if you sort of incorporate moderate activity into your everyday life, then that's a start. And if then you find a thing that you love and you do it more, brilliant. Yeah. But for everybody who thinks it's just it's too much, it's too big, it's about getting started and moving your body as much so as you right. can. So right, it's about those small incremental steps to start with. And then as you get fitter, you find yourself getting fitter and then you can do more, yeah. right? And we're doing it for our physical health and our mental health. Yeah. And that means that we do it at whatever size we are and whatever gender we are and whatever other barriers that people might think, well, I can't can't go because of X, Y, or Z. Actually, you can. Yeah. Yeah. And health and fitness looks different for everybody, but everybody can be putting in their best effort. Philippa, when you, because you said there, it's actually quite a sizable study. How many people to take part need to take part in a study for you to go? Oh, okay. I think that's actually there's, there's, there's some credence in that. Like, is three thousand a good amount of people to kind of? When gauge? we look at a study, we look at lots of different things. So when we come onto a headline later, actually, it's looking at. 35, 36 other people's studies. And actually, yeah. that can be really good because you're using what's called a meta-analysis. But if you've got a study that's got 10 people or 100 people, then the outliers, the people the who are the extremes, which there always will be, yeah. they're going to become statistically more significant because you're going to say, oh, well, there are three people out of 100. But three people out of 3,000 yeah. becomes less significant. Yeah. So having a good number of people in a study is always useful. But then we also need to think about have we got a good spread of age, have we got a good spread of sex, We've got a good spread of de other demographics right, as well. Yeah. What about this one? This one's in the mirror. Uh, NHS warns of three early warning signs of heart attack. What are those warning signs? People often think of a heart attack being central crushing chest pain. Yeah. But actually... That's what you're told, though. That's yeah. what you're told. But what we know is that there can be earlier signs and that you might have pain not just in the chest, but maybe in the jaw, in the neck, in your shoulders, upper back, upper chest, and that you can often get a sort of a sense of impending doom, an overwhelming sense of anxiety. So your body almost, te like, mm, Tells you, you something's and... happening. And sweating. And what we're saying is Foboding, that... Foreboding, like foreboding mm. sort of feeling is that if you aren't sure, phone 999 yeah. and talk through your symptoms. Yeah. It's never too early to talk through your symptoms because time really matters when it comes to heart attacks because there are treatments that we can give and the earlier the better. When you have a heart attack, you have a blockage to an artery that is supplying some of the heart muscle which starves it of oxygen and that we can do things about and what we don't want is for things to progress and potentially even to go into cardiac arrest. And the other thing to say is that women may not have the same symptoms as men. So they may not have those classic symptoms. They're more likely to have neck shoulder pain, but they also might just suddenly feel very, very tired or lightheaded right. and dizzy or might feel very sick. If you think something isn't right for you, you need to go and get so help. So interesting, because you think heart attack, you think you're going to be like lying on the floor, grabbing your chest, but it can be really subtle things. So people with a heart attack are conscious. So that's the thing that people confuse heart attack and yeah. cardiac arrest. So people with a heart attack are conscious, they're awake, they're breathing, they're talking, and somebody with a cardiac arrest, their heart has stopped beating mm -hmm. and they become unconscious. Um, and so it's really important that we talk about those early signs so that you can get the help that you need. Yeah. Okay. Um, interesting one here, because we've talked about it a little bit before, but women are not to ignore the invitation for cervical screening. This is from The Independent. Cervical screening is a test which can pick up cervical cancer before it develops. It is the most amazing screening test because it can stop you getting cancer in the first place. But approximately one in three women don't 
always attend. And there are lots and lots of reasons why that might be happening. But the commonest reason given in the latest survey was that they were embarrassed to attend screening. Other people put it off and other people might have been concerned that it would be painful. Now, the f I understand, of course, we are talking about your genitals, yeah. and that, and especially in certain cultural groups, that that can be more difficult. Your nurse, your doctor has seen it all before. You do not need to go to the beautician or shave or wax. You don't need to worry about any odour. We are simply only focusing on doing the best job that we can. For some groups of people, it might be more difficult. If you are a survivor of sexual violence, that you might be more worried. Tell us if you can. Perhaps book a double appointment, take somebody with you. Let us help you yeah. and give you enough time. And if you are concerned that it's going to hurt, it shouldn't be painful. It might be a little bit uncomfortable. But if it is painful, then tell us. We could use a smaller speculum. Yeah. You know, there are lots of things that we can do. We could ask you to put it in yourselves. This is a test which has the capacity to save your life. And I really, really strongly encourage anybody that thinks, I had that letter, I'm just putting it off. Please make your appointment now. Yeah. Literally, before you know it, it's done and it's over and you're out of there. But, um, yeah, life-saving. Should people make those, uh, those issues and, the, uh, and those worries they have, is that something that they, they do before they get to the appointment or as they get there they can still be sort of kind of catered? So we can always cater. If we know before, then yeah. we may be able to give you a double appointment so that we have more time. Yeah. But, you know, you tell me at any point that you're worried and I'm going to, you know, give you the time that you need. Yeah. And that's why doctors and nurses sometimes run late because, you know, we want to give people the time that they need. But there are definitely lots of hints and tricks, you know, wearing a skirt, for example, so that you feel less exposed. There are lots of hints and tricks that you can do to make things feel a little bit more comfortable. I just close my eyes. Just go like that. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah. And then we're <laughs> you done. You get it done, that's Yeah, important. and it's done. Um, let's talk a little bit about, obviously, mental health and the virus. This is in the Daily Star. And apparently the virus takes toll on mental health, which I probably no could have guessed myself, yeah, to be honest yeah. with you. You can see... Why is this such something. a revelation, Dr. Bell? Because we're, this is something we'd always assume yeah. would, be, would be a fact anyway. We need to be actually survey these things and be clear because the difference between having quantitative data that I can say this is where the problem is and therefore potentially that the government can put more money into mental health services. So it's really important that we actually have the data that backs up what we are seeing every single day in our surgeries, which is that people have been struggling and are struggling. Now, this um, piece of research actually folks said that it was women in their 20s and early 30s that were struggling the most and potentially men over the age of 65 that were the least affected. I have to say that anecdotally, in my surgery, it's everybody. Mm. And it is particularly adolescents, and I'm seeing people who are shielding, you know, who, the, the impact of this is on everybody. And there are lots of reasons, exposure to COVID, you know, worrying about loved ones, financial worries, homeschooling. You know, there, there are a myriad of reasons why people have been struggling. But the most important thing is there is help out there. And the hardest part is often going to your GP and asking for help. But there are talking therapies, lots of therapies of Available, and for some people who are really struggling, medication as well. Yeah. And you're not alone either. No. OK. Uh, the last story is in a Daily Mail. Apparently, attractive people have better immune systems. This is a dangerous so story. I must be very, very <laughs> well. <laughs> I'm only joking. I mean, she hasn't had a cold for years. <laughs> 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 what's, what's going on here? This can't be true. This, this is silly. This um, <laughs> is interesting, and it's one of those pieces of science where you think, why were they looking at that in the first place? But science for the sake of science is huge because that's where you find out other stuff. But this essentially, scientists photographed about 150 people without their makeup on and then asked nearly 500 people to rate them for attractiveness and then looked at their, at their blood. And what they seem to show is that people who scored traditionally highly on what would be considered attractive, which is often things like a symmetrical face, or big eyes, had higher levels of a certain kind of cell in the body, which is sort of like Pac-Man. You know Pac-Man that comes along yeah, and yeah. eats the thing, right? So it sort of eats pathogens. Um, and, and it was one of the white blood cells. And I do wonder, you know, because there isn't a sort of a cause given, but you do wonder whether or not this is some evolutionary thing that we are looking for people that are going to be able to provide or bear children and stay well, and that we look for those sort of subtle signs of health, potentially like bright eyes or something like that, to see whether or not they're good partners. Because at heart, we are all animals. Oh, interesting. I mean, we could do hours on that, couldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> That's a filler, that was great. Really, Thanks, really good. Philippa. Thank you so much. Brilliant.